Well, good morning and welcome. Uh, this is really an awesome panel. I'm super excited to be here. So my name is Mark Donegan. Uh, I run market and business development for Visionular. We're a Codex solutions company working primarily in the area of WebRTC and RTE, which of course is the focus of this conference, RTE 2020. And I'll be moderating this session. We are going to cover a lot of ground over the next 90 minutes. And so um, hang in there with us, because even if, uh, you know, we happen to be on a topic or on a subject that maybe is not relevant or interest to you at the moment, chances are good that in a couple minutes there will be something that um, you will uh, want to know. So you definitely don't want to miss out. The Panelists have worked really hard to put together an information-rich presentation, and um, that's going to be followed by a moderated panel discussion and then a Q&A. So the subject for this session is how to select the best video codec to scale your apps for RTE. And this is a very vast subject. Uh, if you're operating a video service, a platform, an application that requires any form of real-time live streaming, uh, video chat component, or screen sharing functionality, you'll definitely want to take careful notes because you're about to hear from some of the really foremost experts in these areas. Areas. Now, during this session, we have a dedicated chat monitor, so feel free to type in questions in the chat, and we'll do our absolute best to address them, certainly in the Q&A session, uh, if not before. Please change slide. All right, so I want to uh, set the stage for the presentation portion of this session and um, it, it illustrate uh, real quickly where video codecs are used in RTE or WebRTC type applications. And so we're going to focus primarily on two sides, and that would be the client side and the data center. Uh, obviously, the data center could be a public cloud, could be a, a private cloud. Um, but the application of an encoder in each is important to understand um, what the differences are. So let's look real quickly at the client side. There basically are two types of encoders that you'll find on client devices. There's software and hardware. Hardware is most common. Software would be an encoder that typically is installed with your application, uh, whereas hardware is what is resident in the in the device. It's it's native, and of course the use case or the application is typically video chat or screen sharing for business or personal communications on the client side, and probably many of you are building apps and services um, that utilize a mobile phone or utilize um, a browser, some sort of computing device, a tablet uh, for your app to do some sort of screen sharing or, or interactive uh, video communications. Now, the constraint as we're thinking about codec selection and as we're thinking about how to choose the best tool that is codec or encoder for the job, it's important to look at constraints. And so on the client side, uh, we need to be very mindful of what's natively supported. And this is critical because power consumption is often a very important criterion when we're looking at um, particularly software encoders. Um, you know, we have to be aware of how quickly we're going to drain the battery if we're running a certain set of technologies. And of course, the processor power that's available and even the operating system is critical. Now, on the data center, uh, also, we can run hardware and software encoders. Um, for the data center, typically, you're going to find software encoders, although certainly hardware exists and, um, and, and is even needed for certain applications. But because we're talking uh, very robust, very powerful, big machines, we can typically scale um, much more easily, of course, than you can uh, when you're relying on, on hardware for a mobile device, for example. Um, so in the data center, this is an ideal place for very high volume video encoding applications. For example, we may want to transcode um, to some device formats that um, uh, that natively we wouldn't be able to reach. And so that often is best done in the cloud uh, or in the data center. Now, our constraints there are operational cost, 
latency. We need to look at the um, cost and what it takes to move the traffic even to the cloud or to the data center and then to distribute that. So we have a different set of constraints. Please change slide. And before we jump into the presentations, uh, I wanted to give some context to the specific codecs that we're going to be talking about. Now, uh, for, for those that are familiar with, uh, you know, with the various codecs that are both in commercial use uh, and that are maybe coming or, or, you know, are found in certain types of applications, you'll note that the three that we've chosen to discuss are not the only ones that we could be talking about. But again, the purpose of this talk uh, in specifically is really to focus on real-time experiences, real-time engagement. So, um, um, it's very important to look at codecs that uh, have ubiquitous coverage, in other words, that we can use on a wide range of devices, um, as well as um, that that are feasible. They can, you know, they can be deployed relatively easily. They have broad industry support. And so we're going to talk primarily about H.264 or AVC, um, H.265 or HEVC, and AV1. And just to give a, a quick um, uh, overview of each of those standards. Now, starting with H.264, it's it's hard to believe that uh, that codec is now 17 years old. It was launched in 2003, and anywhere from about 90 to 100 percent of video services, uh, regardless of what the use case or the business model is, use H.264. And the reason is simple. It's because H.264 enjoys ubiquitous support uh, really on any, whether it's a entry-level um, uh, feature phone, whether it's a entry-level tablet, whether it's a very low-power PC, or some sort of computing, uh, whether it's a game console that may even be 10 or 12 years old, um, it's almost guaranteed. Uh, in fact, you can pretty much be assured that you're going to be able to deliver H.264 to that device and that it will be able to be decoded. Um, now, uh, that's good. The drawback is, is that as developed and as excellent as this codec is, uh, it is not able to meet the quality and the resolution requirements of, for example, 4K. Um, so even though if we're delivering to a browser and for for certain services, you might say, well, I really don't need 4K. In fact, 1080p is more than enough. Maybe even 720p works. Um, but as consumer device capabilities are growing and as just the cost of these higher resolution displays are going down, uh, even on a mobile device, even on a mobile phone, it's becoming more important to be able to um, really deliver the best experience. And that is why we're going to be talking about HEVC. So HEVC is now seven years old. It was introduced in 2013. And this codec uh, provides up to a 50% efficiency gain over H.264. And so it's an excellent standard. You're going to uh, hear um, some, some talk, quite a bit of talk about HEVC. There are a couple things to know about HEVC. One is that it has suffered from, from some licensing issues. Uh, and, and so therefore, adoption has been held back somewhat. But we're going to see that actually this codec is, is is becoming pretty widely supported. Uh, one drawback is that for browsers, HEVC is not supported. Um, and, you know, this is a very common end device that we are going to be building uh, and delivering, especially RTE type experiences to. And so this takes us to AV1. Now, uh, AV1 is the newest uh, entrant here in the uh, codec race, if we want to look at it that way. And um, AV1 is the uh, successor or really the next generation of VP9. Um, AV1 is two years old. Um, therefore, it doesn't have the device support yet that you would see of HEVC or certainly H.264, although that situation is changing very, very rapidly. Um, but the good news for us, again, in the RTE, web RTC type space is that AV1 is supported uh, in Chrome 
uh, very widely across many, many devices. And in fact, most browsers support AV1. So if you are delivering content primarily to the browser, if that is uh, a primary distribution point for your service or your application, then AV1 could be considered today as um, maybe not the exclusive codec you use, but certainly a dominant uh, codec that you might use in your video streaming mix. Um, the advantage of AV1 is also that it is royalty free. It's a royalty free codec. And uh, so it's uh, unencumbered by some of the um, uh, issues that come with HEVC. Uh, it also includes some really, really excellent tools for bit rate reduction. Um, so we can get it, you know, depending on how the encoders operated, up to 50% bit rate savings even over HEVC. And for screen content coding, um, so like screen sharing applications, AV1 is really ideal. In fact, uh, support for screen content coding is included in just the base standard. Um, so even though um, the decision of what codec to support is not exactly a... Um, a, a binary choice. So you're going to see that it's not necessarily a one or a zero in terms of which codec you should be using in your service. And the ch chances are you, you'll be using multiple codecs. Um, I, I believe, and I think you're going to see through the conversation here that AV1 is really shaping up to be a dominant next generation WebRTC RTE codec. Change slide, please. All right, and uh, with that introduction, I, I really want to stop talking and get directly into the presentations because um, uh, each of the panelists have prepared a really excellent talk that I think you're going to find very, very interesting. So in order to, to preserve time, uh, I've asked each person to just introduce themselves at the start of their uh, their presentation, and, uh, and then we're going to follow this up with a moderated discussion. Be sure to put any questions, any comments in the chat, and we're logging those, and we'll do our very best to get to those. So with that, let's start with Pierre from uh, Blue Jeans. Pierre, are you there? Yes, I'm here. All right, excellent. All right, everybody, I'm taking over. And thank you so much. I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Good morning, everybody. So I'm Pierre Senior Bleu, and I'm leading media engineering at Blue Jeans. Uh, for people who don't know Blue Jeans, we are one of the big players in video conferencing. So very happy to be here and I'll try to get going fast. So next slide, please. So uh, Mark and, uh, and the panel, they asked me to present very much the fundamentals around video codecs. Uh, so I'll, I'll go through that very quickly. Um, as many of you might know already, the codec name really came from, you know, the, the, the short of compressor, decompressor, uh, started to become a big necessity in the 90s where there was a big transition from analog video into digital video. And really back then, uh, because video uncompressed, you know, the example here shows you a, a 720p stream uh, needing more than 300 megabits per second of, uh, of data uh, to be able to, to transmit. That was not feasible to really migrate to digital video. So that's where really Codec came from, um, uh, inventing a block-based encoding technique that would give you a very big compression ratio. So that example here is, Today with H.264, which is like an old codec already, you can actually achieve 200 plus X compression and, and get to a pretty decent quality of a 720p, 30, stream, 30 frames per second stream for video conferencing, for example, at 1.5 megabits. So that's really where it's coming from, uh, the, the need for compressing and, and transmitting or storing data. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, very high level, I'll go, uh, uh, step by step um, uh, to really explain what really a codec is about, whether it's a very old codec like in the two or AV1, the latest, uh, they are all coming back from the same foundation that I'm going to quickly go over. Um, just wanted here to really focus on the fact that the v different video codecs that are out there, they come with a standard and the standard really defines what is a compliant stream and, and how to build a decoder to decode such a compliant stream. And that's what's very cool for the industry is all those years, people, developers, researchers, 
have been really able to get the freedom to design their own encoders to optimize for best quality, to optimize for real time, to optimize for the kind of hardware or software they want to use. So that, that, that's really, uh, that has been fueling the industry for many years and I'm sure it's going to keep going like that for many more years. Uh, one of the things that I think we'll be talking a lot today during the, the, the during the session is very important to step back and, and talk about three factors that are very important about Codex, which are quality of encoding, compression rate, and complexity of encoding. And at very high level, what, what's very important to remind ourselves is those three factors, which are driving uh, video coding, they are really depending on each other. And uh, for example, the, the newest codec are, are really increasing the complexity of encoding. And by doing that, the goal is to keep up the quality and lowering the rate or keeping the rate and improving the quality or going to, to, to bigger frame rate and, and bigger resolution. So those three factors are really uh, depending on each other. So we have to keep that in mind. Uh, next slide, please. So very briefly, uh, the partitioning is our step one when we do uh, when we build a, a codec, uh, an encoder, a, a, a block-based encoder. It's really coming down to you really want to pack your pixels into a, a bucket. Here we call we call that the smallest one. You can call it a macro block, and and the, the you know you can have some slice, you can have some ties, but uh, the, the net net out of partitioning it's really a way to to pack pixels together to make it less complex for, for the next step, which is prediction. So if you go to the next slide. Um, step two, very important step in any codec that you find out there. Um, we what, the, the compression efficiency I was talking about at the beginning really comes from the fact that we are really taking big advantage about the temporal co correlation that you see within fr between frames, right? Um, so it's coming down to what you want to do, and it's not true all the time. So there is the concept of mode decision. I'm not going to go into details on that, but for most of the frames, um, the, you'll be able to find uh, a very good correlation between the current and the next frame. And what Codec do, do a lot is macro block per macro block at very high level. It will look for estimating the motion between the, the current macro block and the next one. And through the motion estimation, the, the ball game is, can we create a predictive frame from the previous frame and the motion estimation? Once you do that, rather than encoding the original frame, encoding the predictive frame, what you end up doing is you, you, you make the difference between those two frames, and you end up with a residual frame, which is shown here in, in gray. Uh, the, the cool thing about that is it really is a lot of zeros, and it's very easy to encode, a lot easier than encoding the original frame. So rather than encoding frame by frame, what you end up doing most of the time is you encode residual frame and the information that comes with the motion estimation. And, and that's really what you, you get a very big boost in compression efficiency with that step. Next slide, please. So step three is once you get through step two, now you need to take it to the next level and implement a transform. So uh, very quickly, the, 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 ball, the ball game here is uh, what the codecs have been doing a lot is shifting the spatial components that are a result of the, of the step two into uh, implementing, a, most of the codecs do uh, implement a DCT, which is really allowing you to move into the frequency domain. Once you do that, which is shown in the, in the second picture here, you are able to pack what really it does is you're packing uh, the values into a, a few locations. So you concentrate the values into a, into a smaller location. And then you do an act of quantization, which is the last step here. Quantization is really to, you, you, you apply a scale to your values and you pretty much classify your value into bigger buckets. And really the net result out of that is you end up with a lot of zeros and a lot less higher values um, out of that transform. And, and that brings us to the last step, uh, next slide, which is step four of encoding, which is really entropy coding. Here, very important to, uh, to, some people might wonder why, you know, why do that in step four? So it's really a journey, right? Step one, two, three, uh, a lot of the steps are really around making the data in a very efficient way uh, to, to really, uh, really get the best entropy coding that you can get. So entropy coding is a well-known, defined uh, 
lossless compression technique. Um, uh, feel free to look on Wikipedia for people who do not know. Um, uh, what, what it does, it's, it's doing an excellent job at encoding binary stream of data when you have lots of zeros and some rare patterns, which is exactly what we ended up doing with all the steps. So entropy coding is really uh, giving you the boost that you need to finalize the compression of your algorithm and, and, and get it to a point where you get those 200x plus compression ratio. So um, next slide, please. And that's pretty much, it. that's my last slide. So the net net, I, I know it's not very detailed and, and my next colleagues are going to drill down into some specific components, but I call that video encoding 101. Uh, encoding, block-based block encoding today is really, the foundation is those four steps. And, and those four steps are really what helps you achieving the compression you have today. And Codex over the years have been improving those steps, have been finding new ways to do things, but it's always coming back to those big fundamentals. All right, next slide. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Rui Zhang. Uh, I'm from Cisco uh, WebEx uh, Business Unit. Uh, WebEx has served in the cloud-based conferencing domain for the past almost 20 years now uh, to provide uh, enterprise users the best real-time experience uh, for collaboration. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so as Pierre mentioned, the overall uh, architecture of the general coding structure, uh, I'll focus more on the uh, very basic uh, predictive coding part. Predictive coding is a fundamental technique uh, for the general compression technology. It utilizes the uh, correlation uh, among signals. Once we remove the, remove the correlations uh, from information theory, the entropy of the remaining signal is uh, getting much smaller. Hence, the later stage of the entropy coding will be more efficient. From a decoding constructive perspective, at the decoder side, the same prediction is produced using previously decoded value, and the reversed uh, error signal uh, is added to re reconstruct the current signal. So in the slide here, I'm going to show one basic, very basic example on the uh, left corner uh, for DPCM. So the signal input we are going to encode, uh, this is very relatively smooth, smooth area, just using example, the signals are 887678. Seven, uh, by doing the prediction just from the immediate previous pixel value, we can get the initial value uh, of 8 and then following by residuals of 0, negative 1, negative 1, 1, 1. This residual value apparently generally has smaller dynamic range, hence better entropy coding efficiency in a later stage. On the decoding side, uh, the residual signals are going to add it back, as we see here, uh, to the, re to the re reconstruction. In reality, uh, there can be many ways to predict, as the signal correlation can, can vary. For example, uh, in the red corner, in the 2D image case, uh, if you look just the grid values, we can see here there are correlations, uh, the luminous order, uh, on the edge information on different spatial directions. Uh, various coding standards, as well as image coding standards, uh, they define ways of possible prediction modes. On the uh, bottom right here, are uh, example from 264 coding, uh, where it defines all those different predictions to do the uh, to do the directions to do different prediction based on the edge uh, info based on the texture. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, as Pierre showed, compared with the two D image signal, video is naturally three D. Uh, there is correlation on the temporal domain as well, so the residual can be calculated among temporal domain. And the natural reason is motion. Either the object inside the picture is moving or the overall camera is moving. So we have different mode uh, for the mode. We have different ways to describe the motion. Mm -hmm. Here I also quickly show this one simple example. Mm -hmm. uh, on the left side uh, is the original frame in one movie. If we just do a very, very basic same position difference calculation without any motion estimation, 
we will get the upper right residual signal, where you still see we have reduced a lot, a lot of uh, redundancies, but there's still some details there. Further down, if we do very simple, very basic motion estimation to get the real motion, here is just shifting two pixels. On the bottom right, we can see the real residual is actually very, very small. So eventually, when we encode this real residual signal, uh, the, uh, the entropy coding, the OR base we use will be very, very uh, uh, efficient. This is an ideal example. Uh, let's do some more realistic, more realistic example. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, here is a, a small drawing I, I, I tried. Uh, so in this case, the car is moving uh, with the trees and the shrubs as the background. Uh, now suppose we are going to encode the current frame in the middle. Uh, in this case, the car can be fully predicted from the past frame. Uh, this direction is called the forwarding uh, prediction uh, direction. However, the part of the small green shrub in the current frame was blocked in the past frame. So if we only use this forwarding prediction direction, we cannot predict this shrub part. Uh, the idea now is that we see in the future frame, uh, the shrub is showing up again. So if we, in the case we allow some coding delay, we can use this shrub in the next frame to predict in the current frame. This is called a backward prediction uh, direction. Uh, so that defines the prediction directions. Now in the different standard, we can see how this is being defined. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, here we come the very, very basic and the common names we often hear, the I-frame, P-frame, and B-frame. In very, very high level, it defines in the frame level how each frame is being encoded based on how their information is being predicted. For iframe, it's purely encoded within the spatial correlation domain. It does not use any reference from its neighbors. While for p-frame, as we showed before, uh, it's using the predictive coded from the reference picture in the time domain of previous happening, happened uh, frames. While B, the so-called B is bidirectional, is leveraging both the previous frame and the future frames. Those are very, very basic concepts, by the way. There are more complicated cases on multiple reference frames, but the key thing here is the coding order and the delay. As you can see from this picture here, this is a very, very typical structure with such IPB frames. It's called a group of pictures. This GOP structure defines a very basic prediction structure within the coding. You see the PUC, that means the picture order uh, count. Uh, that's how the original picture is doing. But you, then you see the decoding order, or uh, encoding order. That's how the uh, pictures are reordered in order to do the efficient uh, co uh, prediction coding. Here, the frame one for eight are the foundation with a single directional prediction. And then based on that, we add two more layers of bidirectional coding frames. So in this case, we can we have the IPP encoded first, and then the two prime B, and then the four secondary B. By doing so, we can leverage all the uh, correlations among all the frames, uh, but with the sacrifice a little bit of coding delay. In short, those are very, very basic concepts are in the video coding, but are very, very important why. Now I'm going to move next to the uh, next slide, please. We're going to move to the next concept. Thank you. Thank you much, Ray. And my name is Sean. I work for Agora, and I'm uh, mostly in the area of algorithm design. And including the codec design, and uh, yeah, next slides, please. Yeah. So previously, Pierre has described the process of encoding, and one of the steps is the transform, and 
I'd like to spend a few minutes to talk about what's followed the transformation. And the transform is essentially very similar to Fourier transform. It maps the pixel domain data into the frequency domain. And the total energy between the two domains are equivalent or are equal. But there's a very beautiful feature of the frequency domain energy distribution, which is most of energy concentrates on a few coefficients. Most of the, the rest of the coefficients are very small, and some of them can be totally ignored. In addition, each of the coefficients can be divided by a value and then represented as multiple of that value. This value is called uh, the quantization. And the values that are used to divide the coefficients can be different for different coefficients. This way, it also provides the ability to adaptly, adaptively choosing the quantization value for each of the coefficients so that the importance of the coefficients can be re represented after the quantization. And the, those values of the division together form the quantization matrix. So in addition to quantization matrix, there's an additional scale factor which is also combined with the quantization matrix. And together, the product of the scale factor and the value of the quantization matrix form the final quantization value. And this scale factor is actually usually called the quantization parameters. We call it QP. The QP value actually provides the flexibility of choosing a finer or coarser quantization values for the for doing the quantization of that block. And the final decision of what quantization value, what QP is using is used, it will be decided by the desired comparison ratio. And that comparison ratio is actually decided by the block called the read control. The read control does look at information like whether the generated bits is a good track of the target bit rate and using that trend and the complexity of the content itself to decide uh, the desired number of bits for the current block. So that way, the QP, the quantization parameter, is decided. And the read control is also very important because it largely decides how good the encoder will be. And it's also an important research area for encoder and it's a rather involving topic and let me not get into too much into that i'd like to spend a few words to talk about the block sizes and on the bottom left of the diagram uh, is used to do the prediction both spatial prediction and temporal prediction and the prediction is used to reduce the redundancy as we just described. And normally, if down to the pixel level, a single pixel is actually very easy to predict from its neighbors, either spatially or temporal neighbors, but it would take a lot of computation for all the pixels to be predicted individually and to be represented by the motion vectors. So it's not practical or it's um, the overhead of doing pixel level prediction it could outweigh the benefits. So that's why a block is usually used. So for a block size, then the size of that block 
also matters. Next page, please. Yeah, so in H.264, the largest block size is 16 by 16. And it is allowed to further partition the 16 by 16 block into smaller blocks such as 16 by 8, 8 by 16, 8 by 8, 8 by 4, 4 by 8. And the smallest block, it would be 4 by 4. So this is usually a, um, a way of like doing the partition in a quarter kind of way. And in areas with simple content, like, like a flat area with very little texture, it may be able to find a, a good match from its neighbors. But for areas with a lot of texture and a lot of high frequency content, if the content itself is moving, it's very hard to uh, find a good match in its neighbors. So it's it will be better if we partition that block into smaller blocks so that the smaller block would have a better chance to find a better match. So that's the reason we do the partitions. And in newer standards like HEVC, the largest block size is 64 by 64. In the newer standards such as VVC and the AV1, the block size is even allowed to be 128 by 128. This larger block sizes allows more options to do subpartitions. So there are more ways to do subpartitions. So in order to choose best mode to represent or to predict current block and its subblocks, there will be a lot of computation involved. So the complexity would be increased. Actually, it's like in an exponential way. And that's why early standards can only afford to smaller block sizes and the newer standards because the advance of the hardware and the more computational power, more complex or bigger block size and complex block structures are allowed. And the decision is normally you need to go in through uh, quite a few options and they choose the best ones to as the block partition structure. And the smart algorithm would actually try to find the uh, optimum or, or near optimum partition structure through a smart algorithm. And yeah, so they generally this, the larger block size is, again, if the area is simple enough, then there's a better chance for the larger block size to be predicted or to be matched by nearby pixels or nearby you know, reference pictures. And next page, please. Thank you. Uh, morning or afternoon, everybody. I'm Josh Barnard, uh, technical director at iStream Planet, uh, where we focus on sort of live streaming of, you know, TV and events. Um, so let me talk a little about sort of the practical implications of all the stuff that was just discussed, right? I mean, we, we talked a lot about features of the Kodak and how the compression works. I'm going to talk through what does that mean for actual use cases. Uh, you can jump to my next slide. So to do that, I'll talk a bit about H.264, obviously this existing standard, incredibly popular versus 265, which is not brand new, but newer and, and sort of what it brings to the table and what the differences are. And kind of the, the quick blurb explanation I'll say is efficiency at a cost. So H.265, much more efficient, or HEVC, much more efficient than 264, but also much more expensive to encode, uh, in software at least. So why go to H.265? I mean, I think they've talked a lot about uh, the different benefits there in terms of efficiency. 50% uh, number has been thrown around, 33% number, but effectively, H.265 can offer humongous savings in terms of the bit rate needed to deliver the same quality. Um, or you can also start to achieve higher quality at the same bit rate. And H.265 is a de facto requirement or, or something as new or newer than H.265 is a de facto requirement for advanced functionality like 4K 
uh, 10-bit encoding HDR. The reasons that were just presented about block size just being one example of why H.264 doesn't scale to these larger and larger frame sizes that we're starting to see. But the trade-off there is really that with 265, software encoding is drastically more expensive. Um, so the trade-off here is much bigger when you're talking about software encode. If you're on devices that have native hardware, HEVC encoders and decoders, you can kind of get around that concern. Um, so what does this practically mean? If you want to jump to the next slide. Um, it's a little hard to tell probably over VC and maybe if you can get a copy of the deck, but uh, so this is the same content encoded with H.264 at one megabit and HEVC at one megabit. And if you can, if you could get in close, you can see like there's all these details that you see in the, you know, look at the top of that spaceship there, right? There's all these little details of the individual wires and the individual lights that you can see on the right, but not on the left. And those details are getting lost when you compress that hard with 264. But HEVC with its expanded toolbox is able to make those things visible to you. So this is a huge benefit when you have very constrained bit rates. Uh, and so this is especially important when you're delivering video to developing countries or countries where 3G wireless is the standard mode of internet access. Um, as an example, we, you know, iStream does largely live sports. We're mostly delivering in 264 today and here in the US. When we've talked to customers in India, you know, they're really constrained there on what they can deliver uh, for a cricket World Cup, for example, uh, or sorry, the, uh, uh, the ashes and things like that. Um, so they'll have millions and millions of viewers, but they're all on 3G networks. And so for them, being able to get a little bit more video quality could be the difference between watchable and unwatchable stream when someone's only able to stream at 100 kilobits or 200 kilobits. Um, so the fact that I found interesting there was they've delivered video in India at to like 25 million people concurrently for cricket. Um, compared to, you know, a large event in the U.S. be like the Super Bowl might have three, four million streamers. But that Super Bowl will actually use more bandwidth than delivering, you know, 25 million people in India. And that's because they're watching at lower resolutions with much more efficient codecs over much more constrained networks. Um, jump to the next slide. So here's an example where, you know, I'm trying to do 1080p at one megabit, which is a challenge for 264. And you can kind of tell that there's this unreadable text uh, on the left, right? So you can't really read it. You're, there's blocking all over the picture. Like you really have a suffering video quality there where it's hard for the user to really experience the content. Whereas on the right, that text in the middle of the screen at the same bit rate with 265 becomes readable. You have smooth edges, you have gradients in the colors instead of just these big flat areas. So you're able to, at the same connection, same resolution, get a much higher quality experience with HEVC. Um, if you wanna jump to the next slide. The other potential trade-off is really with how much bit rate do I need to achieve the quality I want to achieve? So these two images are at uh, UHD or 4K resolution where 264 really starts to struggle. It's very hard with those block sizes and the toolbox that it has. So you can see here to achieve what's effectively the same picture I need almost twice as many bits on the left with 264 as I do with 265. And so really what we've seen in the industry is that for 4K delivery or video, you know, anything over, you know, 4K resolution, 8K resolution, 264 becomes practically unusable. That as soon as that content has any kind of motion or complexity, you start to need bit rates of 25 megabit or higher to deliver with high quality, which is obviously not sustainable for many, many users. And so you really need to start looking at 265 there. Um, I do think that there's been a trend towards equating 265 with 4K or HEVC with 4K, which is a mistake. The benefits of HEVC extend to very low resolutions and low bit rates too, right? I mean, you're going to have a much better experience at one megabit with HEVC than you do with 264. But it's especially true at the high end where effectively 264 is not practical anymore. One other call out here though, is these were encoded with software and you can see the real time, that number is kind of how fast relative to real time was I able to encode these. So even doing uh, 264 at 4K on my pretty fast home desktop is slower than real time, but it's still almost three times faster than encoding HEVC. 
And so in scenarios where you have to encode and or decode in software, 265 really becomes expensive. And so it may not make sense for use cases where you're doing a lot of, especially real-time encoding in the cloud becomes very difficult. That problem largely goes away if you have hardware encode, hardware decode. So if you have an iPhone streaming video to another iPhone, it might make sense to use HEVC where you have you don't have to pay that penalty and you get the higher efficiency. And that's part of why Apple, for example, has really embraced putting HEVC in their hardware for years. They know that their, for their experiences, they can take advantage of the higher efficiency. And by using hardware, they avoid a lot of the penalties. One call out there, though, and this is true of codecs in general, is that Generally speaking, software codecs are higher quality in terms of the compression efficiency than hardware. And that's largely because in software, there's just a lot more room for knobs and tweaks and improvements over time to the codec uh, and handling of different scenarios uh, than you can do in hardware, which has to be you know, obviously planned over many years. Um, so if you want to jump to the next slide, that kind of gives you a quick comparison of 264. And now Jerome's going to talk about AV1. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, this is Jerome. Uh, thank you, George, for um, comparison between the two codecs. Uh, I've been working for Google for several years now, and we started from the real-time optimization for VP9. So about one or two years ago, we jumped on the ship to AV1. So uh, hopefully, I will introduce some uh, real-time optimization for AV1 at this time. Next slide, please. So the real-time mode was added and was included in the most recent release in LibreOM 2.0.0 Apple Jack. And I think it was released back in the May. And we are planning on the next release, probably two or three months from now. So as Josh just mentioned, uh, it's really about a trade-off between different codecs and especially true for the real-time application because the application requires zero latency. So we need our encoder to be as fast as possible. So that's why we use the non-RD based path, which is not the rate distortion optimization path because it uh, requires a lot of more computation. And for the real-time application, we need the CBR rate control, which is constant barrier because we don't want to put too much um, barrier change on the network, which will stress it out. And if we want real-time mode, also supports ad adaptive quantizer mode. So you can have uh, different quantization parameters for different blocks in a frame. To, uh, um, I think we added several speed settings to uh, adapt to the different uh, applications because different applications, you might want to use different like um, bit rate and different resolutions. And you have different devices with different uh, computation powers so we have speed zero, a uh, speed six to nine. Um, and the bigger the speed settings is, the faster the encoder is. But with the trade off, the encode, the image quality will be lower with the faster speed settings. So for the real time mode, we turn off a lot of coding tools added in AV1 because they are too slow, such as like global motion or warp motion, OBMC, or sorts of that stuff. But with the AV1, we still have new coding tools compared to VP9, so we can still achieve a lot of coding efficiency um, compared to VP9 real-time mode. Next slide, please. So the first step we are doing is to do optimization for the ARM devices because um, we need to support a Duo in Google, and the Duo is mostly used on the mobile devices. And the first thing we are consider is uh, to include the codec in the application. Uh, you need to uh, reduce the binary size. You know, the more complexly the codec is, the binary size is bigger, and which is uh, not a good thing for mobile apps installed on the phone. So the first thing we do, we added two flags, which is config real time only and config everyone heavy depths. So we turn off the heavy depths. For the real time, uh, uh, for real time application, and we turn on the real time only, which removes a lot of unrelated code, like the coding tools we don't use for the real time mode. And uh, it achieves a thirty percent binary size reduction, and this makes it possible to include the codec in the mobile application. 
And the second thing we do is to do the knee optimization for the ARM devices, which is essentially the intrinsics for that. And a good thing about knee optimization is you can achieve a huge amount of speed ups with no quality loss because everything is a bit exact before and after the optimization. So with that in mind, we have 20% to 60% speed up with the optimization. Um, and then we tune a lot for the low resolution at extremely low bandwidth, for example, like 30K in BPS. At that low bandwidth, most of the code they can't do anything. You can't get an image, you can't get a video at all for 30K. But with AV1, with a lot of coding tools and the huge coding efficiency, and we can do a lot with the speed six on the quarter VGA resolution. Although the resolution is really low, but it's better than with, with nothing, right? So next slide, please. So this is some numbers I got on the um, Pixel 4, which based on the uh, most recent release. And so as you know, Pixel 4 is a really powerful device. So if you want some, if you want to run it on the lower end device, as we can see for the one thread, speed six is pretty slow for uh, VGA, but it's kind of uh, fast enough for quarter VGA at 40 FPS. And the speed seven, eight, and nine is really fast enough for any device on the quarter VGA resolution. And for the higher resolution VGA, I would recommend using speed eight or speed nine. And for the two threads, I ran it on the VGA uh, resolution. As you can see, that speed seven, eight, or nine is uh, basically fast enough for their resolution on for the two threads. Um, another thing I want to point out is the speed nine for AV1. Although it's the highest speed setting, it's the fastest one, and also it's the lowest quality among all the speed settings in AV1 but it still has a huge uh, coding efficiency gain over VT9. Next slide, please. So the next step of our team is to make more improvements for the higher resolutions. So right now in Label M, we, uh, as we know, AV1 supports very large block sizes up to 128 by 128. But right now we turn that off for lower resolution like quarter VGA and VGA. We only enable it for 720p and above because it's only really benefits huge um, frame sizes. So for the x86, we expect the users will use higher resolution like 720p and even 1080p with multi-threading support. With AV1, we have tile-based and row-based multi-threading and also we are working really hard on adding the scalable video coding to Lego M, which enables the um, like multi-parties uh, video conferencing with different resolutions. And another thing with, uh, is working in the progress is the support, we're adding the AV1 support in WebRC and Chrome. It's kind of like almost ready. We have all the unit tests added to WebRC right now. It's the, um, are still working in the program for WebRC, and I think maybe um, everyone can follow some. Well, I think we have issue trackers for that, so we can talk about that later. Next slide, please. Okay, so I think that's all for me. All right. Well, excellent. I hope uh, that was, you know, an excellent preview and an intro into what we're going to transition now into our panel discussion. And um, uh, go ahead. Next slide, please. So uh, I, I think it's important for those who have been working in video, of course, you know that there are different formats for how video is streamed. And this is just a very simple view that lays out everything from the left to the right uh, with HLS and Dash uh, being on the left side of this particular graph. Um, in terms of the latencies that um, these formats uh, 
allow uh, for live streaming. And since, again, we're focused on real time, we're really going to be talking uh, pretty much exclusively on the far right hand side with WebRTC and, um, you know, the kinds of, of applications and latency uh, requirements that are in maybe the 300 millisecond range, certainly sub uh, one second. Next slide, please. Okay, um, don't need to spend a lot of time on this slide. I really want to jump uh, right into the panel. And uh, so panelists, if you want to come on uh, and turn on your your video cameras. All right, excellent. Good to see you all. And uh, we can go ahead and stop the screen share here as well. Thank you to my very capable uh, operator. Thanks, Patrick. Okay. Awesome. Uh, and uh, go ahead and uh, everyone, you can unmute your microphones and, uh, you know, let's let's go ahead and uh, jump into this discussion. So, um, first of all, uh, thank you so much for the the overview and the intro. I think uh, we should package up that, you know, 40 minute or so segment. And uh, pro probably there's a lot of people who would love to to listen to what was presented. Uh, an excellent overview of just how Codex work. Um, I think the best place to start in this discussion is really let's talk about, you know, what methods um, you apply for selecting a codec. And clearly, uh, each of you have presented the fact that um, there's always a trade off. There's a trade off in compute complexity, um, just how complex the particular codec is. Uh, obviously, I just mentioned that latency is a very important consideration based on what we're designing or engineering a video service for. Um, so I would love it, and uh, Josh, we'll, we'll start with you, and, uh, and then we'll kind of move around the panel here. Uh, if you each could share just one or two tips or best practices for uh, what are the steps that someone uh, should complete or that you would suggest they complete uh, for comparing codecs and comparing codec implementations. And I think this is an important distinction because if we're trying to evaluate uh, HEVC versus AV1, so that would be, you know, comparing codecs, um, we're probably going to follow a slightly different process than if I'm looking for the best AV1 implementation. So I'm comparing two different AV1 encoders. Um, so Josh, um, kick, kick, kick it off with you. And, uh, you know, uh, where do you think we yeah. should start here? Well, it's, it's a little tongue in cheek, but the, the key to picking a codec is to pick H.264. <laughs> uh, but I, what, I, what I really mean there is that, you know, the first consideration has to be compatibility. Where are you trying to deliver video um, and can it support it? 264 has, the reason it's so popular is it has ubiquitous support and in particular, ubiquitous hardware decoding support. And when you can leverage, you really want to leverage hardware decode whenever possible because it makes the video experience much better for your users. It takes away the possibility of, slow decode or other apps on the device preventing your experience from, from working. And in the case of any real-time communication, I think the same probably applies to encode. If you're on a device that's going to be encoding video and you can do it in hardware, you really want to consider that you pick a codec where you have, on all your target platforms, you have the hardware to support that codec. Um, the main drawback with 265 to me is the lack of browser support today, uh, which I think is largely a political issue, but it is a real issue that impacts us. It's a real <laughs> issue. Yeah. yeah. In terms of picking a codec implementation, that's a whole different story. I think that's really more complicated than picking a codec. Like once you've picked that you're going to use HEVC, comparing the many implementations out there is tricky. I mean, you have to, and I think a lot of it is driven for me by, can they beat the open source X265? Or in the case of, in the case of AV1, it's less complicated since there's effectively one implementation. But um for things where there's multiple and there's commercial versus open source, I always start with open source and can I can a commercial codec beat that by enough to justify the expense of paying for a codec implementation? Got it. Well, Ray, um, I know that you're working in the land of open H.264. So what are your insights? 
Yeah, I totally agree with Sean mentioned. Uh, but we are all engineers here, right? But I do want to bring up a, uh, I think a basic one is a business concept, right? What's your cost, right? Uh, the, uh, the, 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 no, what's your business model? Uh, do you, are you responsible for the deployment of this codex, right? That's actually why we did the open to small job. Because remember, open to uh, remember two six four does have relative requirement, right? It has, does have, it still has, uh, but only that it has a, a bundle thing. Once you go over some some amount, then you can be, you know, uh, all uh, same same package, right? It's not poor license, right? So the uh, the uh, the reason behind the scene why we uh, Cisco uh, open source the the two six four implementation and work with the uh, uh, with uh, Mozilla for Firefox, Google for Chrome. Uh, it's because by Cisco is anyways paying the license for a lot of the um, you know, hardware endpoints as as well as software deployment. Uh, so we already you know achieved the, the limit anyway. Then we are collaborating to say, look, now if you download, get those uh, details on how you bundle them. But if you download from here, then we are actually not only providing the technology, but also providing the um, no, the, the payment, right? So that's for, for HEVC, you know, we decided not to do so. Uh, we can control well on the hardware deployments part, uh, the, how many you know, endpoints we deliver. But on the software uh, deployment, you now people just download the install. The, the base is huge, right? So it, it's, it's hard to uh, to decide to the pay structure. So that's somehow uh, we kind of carefully select not to do not because of technical reason, <laughs> it's actually because of commercial reason. Um, so in that case, I personally very, very look forward on the AV1, this concept of uh, royalty free, uh, uh, the, our company, we are also looking into that. Uh, but again, from a real time, you know, there's so many uh, constraint requirements on real time uh, applications. Uh, so that one will, even, I think it will come one day, but just it takes some time to, to go there. Great. It's not engineering, this is more business, more cost, but I, I'm sure this is something um, any uh, business, any company to start to think about. Yeah, thank you. Excellent. Sean. And yes, thanks, Mark. And my fellow panelists has also mentioned those factors. I totally agree with them. And for us, it, it always comes down to availability and the complexity and the coding efficiency. And so availability is certainly an important factor. We want to make our customers and enable them to reach the broadest audience, the users. So if a codec is widely supported, either through hardware or uh, by the, all the browsers and also probably simple enough to be implemented in most majority of the platforms or the mobile devices, then it's definitely favorable, uh, a favorable choice. And yeah, speak, uh, speaking about complexity, once it's falling within the allow allowable range, we will be able to like do some more explorations to choose the best tools within the codec to get more coding gains. Like even for H.264, in our industry, we are still seeing that it has the potentials to, to, go, to go higher coding gains. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and also uh, the license term, yeah, as everyone says, it seems a very critical point factor to, to, for a codec to be successful. So a clear and simple license terms seems necessary for, for a codec to take off in applications. Yeah, there's no Mark. doubt. There's no doubt that um, licensing uh, complexity uh, makes it, you know, very difficult for a standard to be adopted. So yeah, for sure. Now, Pierre, I'm uh, you know, wondering if you can comment uh, from a slightly different perspective when you think about um, 
evaluating uh, both codecs and implementations. I know that, um, you know, BlueJeans, obviously you're smack dab in the middle of WebRTC, but um, throughout your career, you, you know, you've worked in maybe more traditional broadcast type encoding and, uh, you know, so you've seen a, a wide variety of use cases. Yeah. How might someone you know, who maybe is operating a service that certainly has a real-time uh, component to it, maybe that's even the core, but they're also needing to uh, distribute via, you know, HTTP, you know, live streaming. So using Dash or using, you know, um, are there any differences, you know, in how they might go through this process? Or, um, yeah, I think that would be really interesting. I think, especially back in my broadcast days where I spent many years um, really focusing on the best video quality and, you know, squeezing the bits and, and delivering for sports and things like that, I think what I found over the years is the act of selecting an implementation, um, you have to have, uh, it's more about, you, you need to focus on quality and efficiency and, and have, like, a consistent way to to, you know, we've seen so many graphs and so many reports on this is the speed I can achieve with my codec and this is the quality I can achieve with my codec. Um, I think it's, it's, it needs to be something that you do inside as well. You have to run your own evaluation, usually with very consistent uh, different uh, video, uh, video sequences that you keep on using to compare different implementations and really evaluate yourself the quality, whether it's from, you know, instruments like, uh, like SSIM or those metrics that you can use, but it's also very important that you actually spend some time watching video um, and, and make a decision yourself, you know, because everybody has different angles on video quality. Video quality for video conference, it's more about can I do a good job at static people, you know, talking heads, where in sports, it's more about, you know, is the grass looking uh, kind of fuzzy or can I spend the bits in the right place? So I think it's the, 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 the high level answer is really coming down back to your specific use case and, uh, and, and run the test along those lines and, and make sure that you, you, you really focus on, on what you want to achieve for your service. Um, the last thing I wanted to bring is at least for me, uh, and Bougie is the same thing. I have a tendency to want to stress the implementation. So you want to feed your codec with things that are stressful for the codec, like, uh, you know, uh, uh, sequences with confetti if you are doing broadcast and, you know, uh, water, blue sky, things that are difficult. And, and then that's how you can gauge whether, because on sunny days, I think it's, it's, it's kind of easy to make it work. But if you have like stressful content to deal with, you want to make sure that you select a codec, an implementation that can keep up and does not explode in your face. Right. So that's important. Yeah, I think I think we've all encountered the um, encoder buster reels, right. <laughs> you know, with lots of very complex scenes. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Pierre. Um, uh, uh, Jerome, um, what are you know what's what's your input um, about evaluating codecs and implementations? What are your thoughts? Um, I think there are two things I want to talk about. The first thing is uh, I think uh, in terms of that. People should really think about how their how their application is gonna do. Like for for the AV1 launched in Duo, the most reason is that there are still a huge amount of users in the world that they have very very limited network sets. So they have extremely low network bandwidth, like 30k, 50k, and no other code that can do it except AV1. So we optimize AV1 to do that, and also in a real time manner. So we enable those users to have access to the real-time like video chat, like especially in this pandemic, which is extremely important. And another thing I want to say is when evaluating the quality difference between two codecs, I think we should really look at the um, two different things. One is subjective and the other thing is objective. Mm -hmm. And because sometimes the metrics can, can um, can be different from what you are looking from your eyes. Uh, Sometimes maybe the PSNR or VMAF or SM, they are similar, or it's actually one is better than another. But when you look at it from your eyes, the visual difference is kind of sometimes huge. So that's what I want to say about it. Yeah. So I, I, I'm actually going to interrupt the flow here because I think it fits well. And um, this question is coming to you, Jerome. Um, 
somebody asked in the chat uh, why we're not talking about VP9. Uh, because the comment is, you know, quite a few platforms support it. Um, obviously, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a proven, well-known uh, codec. Um, I think since you've spent uh, time working on VP9 at Google, and uh, of course, as AV1 is the successor to VP9, maybe you can just comment a little bit about um, where the transition is, uh, even just more broadly, you know, outside of Duo, um, even. Um, from VP9 to AV1? Um, I think VP9 came in a little bit awkward situation between VP8 and AV1 because uh, when VP9 came out, and even after several years, like a, lot, a long time, there wasn't many available hardware encoders, especially on the mobile devices. Mm -hmm. And it's a lot more complex, uh, complex than VP8. So if you want to encode it on the phone, it's still gonna, um, it's still gonna use a lot of like power and uh, computational um, resources. So um, and then AV1 came out with a huge support from uh, the hardware manufacturers. You know the AO Media, the Alliance, it has a lot of hardware manufacturers in it. So after that, people started, we started looking into the hardware support of AV1 because right now, hardware manufacturers, they kind of, uh, implant in a, they use more of their resources on AV1 instead of VP9. So in the near future, I don't think the hardware manufacturers, they will put out more VP9 encoders instead of AV1. So another thing is uh, the VP9 is actually has been using a lot on the desktop. Like the Google uh, Hangout right now, it's Google Meet is using VP9 for on the desktop, on laptop and desktop devices. So because VP9 has really, really good SVC support, scalable video coding, which is uh, really useful for the multi-party video conferencing. Um, but on mobile devices, we are um, kind of expecting more on the AV1 side. Yeah, that's excellent. Well, um, you know, we, we've talked a lot about, and there's been a lot of mention about the trade-offs um, in, in video. And, you know, one of the things working in video is you get very, very comfortable with, with trade-off. There are no absolutes. <laughs> there is no, there is no silver bullet. Um, we had a, a, another question here um, that uh, I think if I'm reading this correct, um, which codec um, d did we suggest? So in other words, which codec is the winner? And uh, I think we can summarize that, uh, you know, it's application specific. There's so many considerations and it's really, uh, I think, not even possible necessarily to say uh, codec A, B or C is is the winner. Um, but I, I think it's interesting and I'd like now to talk about um, the, the role of quality codec performance and efficiency because it is important uh you know that we think about there are certain types of services so for example if i'm licensing premium hollywood content for example then um quality is a very important uh, bar for for my selection criteria. Um, that's not to say that if you're operating a video conferencing platform that you don't care about quality, um, but it's probable that you're going to care about maybe more efficiency, for example, um, or even codec complexity. Um, and you know certainly there's other applications. And so the question then for the panelists, and I, I'm going to kind of just throw thro throw this question out and let the first person who wants to grab it, uh, you know, begin to talk and and give your thoughts. Um, when you're looking at the three codecs that we're focused on today for this session, H.264, HEVC, and AV1. Um, you know, what are some of the things that someone might want to think about if they're primarily concerned? Let's just first talk about quality. Um, you know, how might they rate uh, all things being equal, assuming that their device ecosystem can support all three codecs? Uh, how might they think about uh, codec selection, you know, if your primary requirement is quality? Who wants to, who wants to jump in there? Uh, I'll, I'll, I guess start. Uh, great, if you are, great. If you 
are rich, right? If you are rich in terms of <laughs> so, so you just afford the best, right? So the the uh, as you mentioned, the two six four is already seventeen years old when we were in schools, right? Um, <laughs> I guess not for for Durham, he might be younger. Uh, so now we have much much better tools, right? And also Sean mentioned, uh, if you're doing 4K, you do 8K, you do 10 bit, right? 264 was not designed for that. Uh, so if you do, if you are rich, if you are the no, 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 it's always the the newer. That's also why the standard are moving forward. Right? The newer standard uh, gives you the uh, uh, no the uh, the better, the more diverse the tools. Uh, no, the, the better you no know, coding efficiency uh, if you are rich. But as you mentioned, it's always a three-dimensional trade-off, right? The quality, the efficiency, and the speed, the complexity, right? But I, I jump in because it's an easy answer, so I will give the more tougher questions to, to all the other people. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's, it's almost impossible to conceive of without You're the uh, For me, like, that's what drives the decision. And I think, you know, when we look at Maybe this is less true now, but a year or so ago with AV1, you might get a 5% or 10% improvement over HEVC quality at the cost of a 200x increase in yeah. encoding time or something like that. So yeah. the trade-off there was you had these diminishing returns around quality and was the performance, if you had an absolute unlimited amount of CPU cycles, you would pick AV1, but were you getting enough value for that input? I think AV1 has come a long way in terms of improving that, but it's still significantly slower to encode than the HEVC. Um, the other historical thing, and this kind of gets a VP9 too, was that especially the VP codecs, there was a sense that they were tuned to drive better metric performance, like the SIM would come out better, but the visual quality would be lower. And so I think that's something where historically HEVC has really excelled has been, or, or the MPEG codecs have excelled is they've really optimized a lot for perceptual quality. I think AV1 has improved that a lot. I think part of why that codec is promising is that companies like Netflix and the like have come in and tried to push that importance of the visual quality versus metrics performance that has long been a thing with MPEG and really drive that into the AV or the VP codec line. So I do think there's a little bit of a question there of you know whether HEVC has struggled with film grain. Is AV1 better at film grain? And maybe in your scenario, that matters a lot or doesn't matter at all. That's right. Yeah, maybe to, to me at least, whether it's broadcast or video conferencing, a lot of it is usually cost driven. Um, you know, like you can get very decent, very good 1080p60 um, quality with a 264 if you have enough bandwidth and, and why would you go to a codec if you don't need to? Uh, but at the same time, I think when you start thinking about Next gen, you know, higher frame rate, higher quality for lower bitrate. Like something I think is the extreme case, uh, whether you want to push down, like Josh would talk about, like push down the bitrate extremely low and keep up with quality. That's where you need to start venturing in being willing to spend more money at the issue and, and migrate to a codec that might uh, require a lot more compute, might require end devices to have a lot more CPU cycles to do software decode. And is it really worth it? Are people going to be willing to to, to go through that journey? So to me, I'm, I'm, uh, in those years, I'm finding that going with a new codec, with, you cannot just forget about the old one and go to the new one. You have to find ways to introduce a new codec in your ecosystem as kind of the new kid on the street who is going to be uh, you know looking better, but not for everybody yet. And then slowly but surely, you 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 make the transition away from your old codec to the new codec. Um, it cannot be a black and white. Like, let's forget about H.264. MPEG-2, uh, back in the cable space, right? MPEG-2 stayed uh, for a long time before people migrated to H.264. So I think it's, it's, it's going to be like that again for everyone. There's still mezzanine file delivery in MPEG-2. <laughs> we still receive SD video streams. And there you go. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, that's, um, yeah, thank, thank you. Now, 
Um, what about, you know, performance or speed? And, and here, you know, I think it's, let's talk more about implementation um, because obviously with each new generation of Kodak, the complexity increases. And so, you know, Josh, you're, you know, you made a, a very astute observation. I mean, AV1, um, especially um, from those who are kind of coming from an MPEG perspective, uh, two years ago, it was pretty easy to kind of shoot down AV1 because it was, um, you know, you mentioned like orders of 100x or even 200x. Um, now that was, you know, for non-optimized, uh, the original non-optimized encoder. And now the gain is is so much uh, faster and, you know, the efficiency. So there is an improvement. Um, but how, uh, you, you know, how should someone think about uh, codec complexity because again you know h264 is fairly high performant um, uh, not fairly it's extremely high performant when we compare it to hevc and certainly av1 um, and yet you know we have faster chips we have faster devices uh, i i mean it's just remarkable uh, moore's law is still very much in um, you know uh, valid so uh, what about performance how do you think about that? You know, and Jerome, uh, I'm going to sort of throw this on your plate. I hope you don't mind, uh, because, you know, I know that you are really looking at, especially for Duo, um, uh, you know, an ecosystem where you have really significant bandwidth constraints, where probably your users are not on these, you know, really advanced devices. They're not carrying around iPhone 11s and iPhone XSs and, you know, whatever. So, uh, yeah, so... Um so we have different speed settings in AV1, speed 6 to speed 9. Speed 8 and 9 is especially designed for the lower end devices. Like, uh, um, like I showed in my presentation on Pixel 4, we can do like 200 to 300 frames per second on uh, speed 8 and 9. So on lower end devices, we're expecting at least 50 or 60 frames per second on those two speed settings. And those two speed settings, although they are really fast, and they actually... Uh, Quality-wise, compared to VP9, they're still almost 20% better on the quality, like save at least 20% um, base frame size. Um, another thing I want to point out is that people often ignored before that the decoder complexity. Because decoder is usually really, really fast and like thousands of frames per second decoding speed. But right now, people have video conferencing with 20 people, 30, 50 people. And if everyone wants to be visible on the screen, you have 50 decoders running at the same time in one session. So we are we are coming across that problem in Google uh, Meet right now um, because there are so many decoder instances running. And so the decoder complexity is really, really a big problem right now. And people kind of ignored that before. So right now we are working on that. And we have different kind of solutions for that because when you have 50 people on the screen, everyone is so small on the screen that you can't really tell much of difference of the quality. So on that, in that case, we are lowering, um, we are lowering the qualities, and so to make the uh, turn off the, like loop filter and all those are features to make the decoder much faster. Um, yeah, that's what I want to talk about. I'm really happy that you just brought up the decoder because uh, we almost went uh, a full 90 minutes and and barely, I think maybe I referenced it and there were a few other references of the decoder, but we didn't talk about the decoder and it is so critical. I especially like, and, and in fact, I think we'll end with this because um, it's very appropriate. Uh, and just a quick comment um, to the audience. If you have any questions, uh, we have about uh, six or seven, eight minutes left here. So um, just enter them in the chat bar and, and we'll do our best to get to them. Um, but going back to the decoder, so you mentioned optimization of the encoder um, relative to the decoder. So where you're actually altering the bitstream um, with a very careful view of, how, of whether that decoder is going to be able to more easily um, uh, decode it. Uh, so um, you know, Sean, uh, Pierre, um, both of you are operating, uh, and uh, obviously Ray as well, but uh, I, I would love to hear from Sean and Pierre. You know, you're operating WebRTC services. Uh, I know that, you know, BlueJeans has massive scale. Of course, Agora is powering, you know, hundreds, thousands of platforms. Um, 
what you know can you comment on this role of the decoder and the interaction with the encoder and the decoder yes Mark. yeah yeah that, definitely and uh, decoder is definitely very important actually yeah it's first every generation of the of the codec is actually first is popularized by the decoder deployment right so because in in the past the broadcast broadcasting industry as well as the the video on demand industry as long as you have a decoder you may be able to provide the services to those people right to those uh, users and now for for the real-time engagement applications decoder is also also uh, an important factor of of our decision as well and again as i said earlier we want our services to reach the broadest user basis so so we we actually like in our current case um, I, to be honest as the coding technology researcher we always love to work on the newest standards because it's cool and uh, it's also in intellectually challenging but when we come down to select the codec we have to be practical and uh, for example uh, yeah the, right now majority like over 90 percent of our use cases are still based on h.264 and uh, this uh, and in a lot of cases we still want to you make use of software encoder and the software decoder because we will be able to do some customized optimizations for example right we are uh, unlike choosing a new generation of the codec uh, standard we are actually going like some unconventional optimization utilizing deep learning we are able to like uh, simulate the perceptual human visual system perception perception mm -hmm. and we use deep learning model which is a very small and they can when combined with h.264 or h.265 we get additional like 30 percent or more compression and, and the model is so small and we can like uh, run in uh, mobile phone cpu or uh, mobile phone gpu or mpu like only like a few milliseconds per per 720p frames and also our users our customers right now uh, is leading to provide hd services more and more so smaller resolutions is no longer satisfy the end user the situation for for the for a higher better experience so we we need to like stream like HD or like at least seven twenty p kind of uh, services to to the end users. So complexity is still very very the most important at this moment. Yeah, yeah. and, and uh, over the years we know that yeah our code implementation is getting better and better. Everyone will be no exception as time goes on. I believe. That everyone implementation will be getting better and better too and also yeah. as you said the decoder if the decoder getting uh, widely deployed i believe it will help everyone to take off that's right yeah thank you and um uh, pierre i want to give you we have about two minutes left so <laughs> to relate on what jerome was, saying, was talking about so we obviously deal with the same set of issues where you have a massive amount of streams coming to the endpoint and we need to decode all of them so it, it's very tricky i think uh, what, there are lots of tricks that you that you can play lower frame rate uh, encode with a lot more noise filtering uh, to, to to really squeeze down on bit rate uh, for example h264 you can, you can use different entropy coding you know you can use kabak or cav or c that, that gives you a quicker a much quicker way to decode because it's software based so there are lots of tricks that you can apply and i think going from one codec to the next what i'm hoping what i'm finding is 
the, 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 the amount of tools that you have in front of you is getting bigger and bigger every time. So uh, with everyone, I think we'll have a lot more capabilities to really optimize for a lot of decoding and better things. Uh, one other thing that I think is very key to everyone that I would like to see, um, and to conclude on that, SVC was very uh, like a flop uh, back in H264 days. You know, a lot of uh, people out there built like SVC capable. It, it really never took off. And I think there is a potential with everyone to really take SVC to something that works and functions and send one stream and, and being able to have temporal layer and, and special layer. And I'm looking forward to that in everyone. It would be good. Yeah, that's great. Well, we are at uh, at the time limit here, and uh, you know, I just want to um, uh, for everyone in the audience, uh, if we were live in the room, I would, you know, we'd all clap and applaud. But thank you, panelists. This was just really a tremendous session. Uh, thank you again for sharing all your insights, and I think we can summarize this full 90 minutes to say that there is no one codec to rule the world. Uh, <laughs> there is no silver bullet. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that's good because for those of us who are technical and engineering minded, then we're always going to be challenged to deliver the best quality uh, to our user and, and to our users and, to, you know, combine the uh, best solutions. So thank you again for joining and um, uh, have a great rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you much. Bye. 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 -bye.